Okay, welcome back, people. Uh, it's three o'clock here in Berlin. So I think we are ready to start. Lukas, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. So the first talk for the second part um, is Unsync your web app in 10 minutes with Starless. Uh, you have 10 minutes, Lukas. Um, all right, let's go then. Uh, this is going to be very quick, so I'm going to skip introductions. Hi, I'm Lukas. Uh, you can meet me on Discord later. Um, AsyncIO, we use it because it kind of uh, solves the guild problem in Python. Um, like it can maximize the usability, the usage of a single thread by allowing us to do many things at once. For example, if you have a regular web application that does multiple database queries, you can kind of make them at the same time instead of waiting for one to finish before you start another. And spoiler alert, this is what we're gonna do today. If you would like to learn AsyncIO and you don't know it yet, uh, I encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where there's gonna be a series of videos. There's already two, there's gonna be eight that introduces AsyncIO a little slower than today. So another spoiler alert, this is what we're gonna be building today. So some kind of, you know, Twitter microblogging thing. Um, let's start with just using what every uh, Python programmer should be using. So first of all, poetry, uh, which kind of uh, sets your project uh, right, right from the get go. And then, you know, like required dependencies. So adders, JP, hotel, click, things that pretty much every application should have. Uh, so having those, um, like, let me comment on um, poetry specifically. It's nice, it's using PyProject Tomo, uh, and it allows us to pretty much interact with, uh, you know, our PyProject Tomo file through like add, you know, you can add the dependencies of dev uh, or whatnot or whatnot, uh, you know, install things in your environment and whatnot. So I like it. Uh, for the virtual ends, probably you want to use a virtual end wrapper. Uh, I like it a lot. You can just say work on something and that works very well. So the PyProject Tomal file will look something like this after this invocation. It is kind of boring because it doesn't have our main dependencies. So the main dependencies for today are going to be Starlet, which is an AsyncIO uh, based uh, ASGI framework. Uh, Jinja 2 for um, templates, UVCon, which is going to be our server, and SGB for the database, as you probably uh, already kind of expected. Uh, so right, so uh, how does a very, very simple single page, and I mean the source code, uh, Starlet uh, application look like? Well, it looks like this. Uh, it is kind of overwhelming at first. You're like, oh my god, there's already 30 lines of code. Well, but it's mostly imports and some configuration like dbol equals true or what is the current directory like nothing very interesting happens here yet the most important thing is the app object right with the app object uh, like our server is going to be able to pick up our, our our stuff or you know start our application and serve it to uh, the user um, we already route two things here, like very basic, right? So um, we can force some error to appear and 404 if there's any um, uh, URL that we don't support. So um, we can already see that there is something that Starlet outputs. Uh, so like, you know, a very ugly um, 404 with no uh, static files yet. So no CSS, no images, and some nice trace back with five, uh, 500 because there's debug equals true set. But wait, how did we actually get there? Well. Uh, we got there by starting UVCorn, right? You just say your package name, um, you know, module, uh, colon, which object. And I also use reload. Uh, 404 will log, 500 will also log with a nice traceback. So you can use all of those things. With reload, you can also reload files like automatically when you're just saving stuff. So that, that is very useful. It shuts down cleanly. I like it a lot. So having this app uh, object already, we can start, you know, kind of adding more things to it. And Starlet comes with many niceties that are kind of right in the right moment of like being, well, opinionated, but also pluggable. So one of those things is support for static files and redirections and whatnot. It's all ASGI compatible. So static files is already there. So we can, for example, make the fav icon support ready for us. Uh, but the more we do stuff like this, the more we're going to see that, you know, like we need some configuration. We need to put some configuration there. So in the 12 factor apps, what we're typically using is just environment variables. So again, Starlet is great. It has this uh, support built in. Uh, and you can already see in line 16, uh, PyPizza debug is an environment variable that we can use to set or unset debug for our case. Uh, 
but it also takes a path. Why? Well, because it, there's a .env file and we already have stuff here. Like, you know, spoiler alert, there is HDB uh, database, like, you know, login information there. Um, so yeah, like we can use this to kind of steer our application without having to pass environment variables and that will also work. So that is a very nice thing uh, to be able to use for configuration. So let's remind ourselves how our app looks. Now we need to talk about like actually building this. So there's gonna be some database talk. This is gonna be really short. Uh, so what do we see here? What types do we see? Well, if we kind of uh, invented a language that can describe the schema that we're seeing, and it kind of reads like English, you would see say that there's some note that has some text. There can be maybe images, like there's not on the screenshot, but maybe there are going to be images. And content, you know, has some title or not. Uh, it's named, so there's going to be some unique way for us to address it. It has tags. We can already see them on the left side and, you know, hashtags uh, on every piece of content. And it's publishable, right? So we can select, you know, whether it's published or not, whether it's deleted or not. So what are all those extended types there? Um, like the, the stuff that you've already seen is on the left and on the right are those abstract types. So a title is something that has a title property. A name is something that has a name property, but it's a slug. So it's going to be something that, you know, it can be put uh, in a URL. And it's exclusive, right? It's constrained. So uh, it's going to be unique across our, our database, which is great for URLs. Uh, it has tags. So that's going to be something that has a property. But multi-property, meaning there can be many tags. And it's publishable, again, some daytimes it can be deleted or not. So that's essentially how uh, like, you know, an HDB's uh, schema definition language looks like. Um, there's also some scholars here, like, you know, so we can set like kind of um, advanced constraints, like, you know, like the slug should look like a, a slug, the tag should look like the tag, the SHA one should be, you know, 20 bytes long, exactly. So I don't want to bore you with this because this is not an HDB talk as much as I would like uh, to introduce you to HDB right now. Uh, so let me just show you like from the HDB CLI how a, a query that gets us the uh, tags on the left looks like. Uh, this is actually literally the query that we're using in the code. What I like to do is put all of my queries in a separate file. Like we're not going to go through this entire file because again, it's not an HDB talk, but you can already see in line 36 that the select distinct that we just uh, watched is literally there. So that is pretty cool. Um, again, the dot and file already had support for our HDB credentials. So let's just put them in the file so that we can use them. And having this, we can actually use something that is production grade. So instead of just having one naive co uh, connection to our database, we can set up a database pool that later, like if we have uh, 10,000 customers coming, we can actually reuse. Uh, so Starlet has this very nice concept of events. So we can hook to those events like startup and shutdown to set up a pool or uh, shut it down. And at this point, we are getting really close to what we wanted to do. So uh, to our async dev that shows us how the main page looks like. So the main page would look like something like this. Uh, there's going to be a template that is going to be rendered. Uh, and it's going to show us the tags on the left and some pieces of content uh, in a stream. So to achieve that, like, we just need to execute our queries with two awaits, right? But as we said, you know, that, that should work. And in fact, it does. If you um, um, display this in a browser, you will see the content right there. But again, it's kind of not what we wanted from the picture at the very start of the talk because those queries are, um, you know, executed one by one. But AsyncIO has a superpower, which means you can make many things happen at the same time. So we can use AsyncIO gather instead of those two awaits to just say, please make those things happen at the same time for me. So just to come back again to the previous slide, you can see that we literally reused the same queries, but instead of awaiting on them directly, we put both of those in an async IO gather call such that we could actually now have this uh, tempo cut. So this is the thing that we achieved going from some kind of slower application to a faster application thanks to async IO. And in fact, that application is already uh, set up to support very many customers because you can do the same uh, that we did right now on the framework level. And, um, and Starlet is doing that for us and Uvicorn is doing that for us. So that pretty much uh, is the end of my talk for today. If you were curious about HDB, 
uh, and you would like to kind of play around with. We just launched, like literally at 6 a.m. today, I finished the setup for AWS so that it works. There's tutorial.hdb.com, which is an interactive tutorial going straight from the browser to a cluster of databases. So you can literally put queries there, uh, change them, uh, click around and see what happens. It's a full tutorial that will explain to you what the deal is and why I'm even uh, kind of, you know, bothering with a new database in 2020. Uh, I think you should too. Thank you very much. Uh, that was Wukash Langa. Follow me on Twitter. Uh, let's talk on Discord. Thank you, Wukashi. What a great talk. Thank you. I really love for, yeah, for uh, Sika, you and Salet. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. And you have a lovely t-shirt. Thank you. That's the only right t-shirt for today, right? <laughs> yeah, you're right. Jill, are you in? I am. Oh, you can okay. hear me. Yeah. Okay. So yes, and, uh, and next we have Ben Nuttall talking to us about PyBots, Python management repository for the Raspberry Pi. Jill, I think it's pretty hard to hear you, or maybe I'm the only one. Oh. Is it? How about now? Pretty much uh, the same. Is it the same? Let me increase the volume. It sounds like robotic, that's the thing. It's just technology, you know? <laughs> it could be the internet as well. Ben, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Oh, cool. Oh, nice background. Uh, I love the, the background. <laughs> A lot of memories. <laughs> uh, can you hear me better now? Uh, no, really. Uh, but yeah, you, you can try to fix your connection and then, yeah, we can get back to you. Uh, so in the meantime, I will introduce Sounds good. you. Um, Hi, Ben. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Let me just get my slides up. Okay, cool. Are you streaming from... From what, sorry? Are you streaming from where are you located? Uh, Cambridgeshire. Cambridge, okay. How is the weather there? It's actually really nice. It was a little grey this morning. Uh, but uh, maybe I'll go for a government-approved um, walk later. Okay, okay, cool. Um, so the next speaker is uh, Ben. Uh, he's going to talk about PyWheels, a Python package uh, repository for Raspberry Pi. Uh, ben, you have 10 minutes. Great. Okay, thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about PyWheels. So first of all, um, I'm Ben. Uh, I, I work at uh, a software engineer at BBC News Labs. Uh, but previously, I only joined them in uh, January. Previously, I was at the Raspberry Pi Foundation. And I've done a lot of uh, Raspberry Pi open source projects, and I'm kind of keeping a couple of those going. Um, I got created GPI Zero, Pi Wheels, and uh, I'm one of the founders of Pi, Pi Jokes as well, along with Alex, one of the organizers of this. Uh, I write for opensource.com about Python and Linux and various other things. Uh, this is what I look like in real life, um, pre lockdown, and this is what I look like on the internet, Finn from Adventure Time. Uh, so why did I create Pi Wheels? So before Pi Wheels, pip installing on Raspberry Pi would take ages. Uh, people don't generally build ARM platform wheels, just uh, x86, x86, x64, uh, Intel um, platform wheels for Linux, Mac, and Windows. And I'll go over that uh, in the next slide. Um, and so I, w I wondered if it'd be possible to uh, build a repository full of uh, ARM compiled wheels. Um, and it turns out it is, so I did. Um, so when you're uploading uh, a pure Python package to PyPy, um, so a lot of the projects I've worked on have been like this. So you only need to upload two files generally. So if it, if it supports two and three, you can create a universal Python wheel uh, and usually provide the source distribution to go along with it. Uh, so you just upload those two files and everyone is able to use your, uh, your library, your package. Uh, but if you're building a more complicated, more complex uh, library, uh, so something like NumPy, which is, uh, has C extensions. Uh, this needs to be compiled for every specific, Python, every minor Python version you want to support, and for every architecture you want to support across all of the different uh, OS uh, distributions. So uh, you it would end up with something like this. So if you support 2735, 36, 3738, for instance, 
and you want to support Windows 3264, Mac, Linux 3264, that adds up to 26 wheels, uh, sorry, 26, 25 wheels plus your source distribution. So there's a lot of things you've got to create and then publish uh, to, to PyPy so people can use it cross platform. Uh, so, um, but uh, Raspberry Pi users actually aren't satisfied by uh, any of these requirements, so they have to fall back on the source distribution uh, and build their own, uh, build it from scratch. So, uh, Pi Wheels aims to provide ARM wheels that are designed to, to work on the Raspberry Pi, so that the uh, so that they can just pip install packages and they just work. Uh, so, Pi Wheels itself, the project is an open source project made by myself and a guy called Dave Jones. Uh, it's the tooling that uh, automates the building of the wheels for everything on PyPy. So every single package, every single version. Um, it's tailored towards the ARM platform. So the, the source code in PyWheels is kind of tailored towards that, but uh, it could easily be tweaked to use for another purpose. Uh, PyWheels.org is the website of the repository itself. So it's a Python package repository, just like PyPy. It hosts ARM wheels of all the packages on PyPy. Uh, and the website pywells.org comprises the simple index, which is what PIP uses, project pages, so you can browse uh, the website and look about which packages are available, and then there's a blog and, and various other information pages. Uh, so this is, compared to the table we looked at earlier, this is what um, we provide uh, for every package. So uh, we support Raspbian, so, uh, and the last three versions of Raspbian that are still in support, uh, Raspbian Jesse, Stretch and Buster have Python 3.4, 3.5, and 3.7. So we just purely build uh, for, for those, those specific versions. And then there are uh, Linux ARM v6 wheels and v7 wheels, which are the, the two different architectures used in the Raspberry Pi 1 and then the Raspberry Pi 2, 3, and 4. And so a lot of people presume we cross compile the wheels, so building them on Intel architecture but targeting ARM. Uh, nope, we eat our own dog food and compile on, pure, uh, on, on Raspberry Pi hardware provided by this service from Mythic Beasts, a uh, hosting company that provide uh, cloud Raspberry Pis. So you can actually spin one up and use a, a whole physical Raspberry Pi. So we have a, a cluster of those. This is what the stack looks like. Uh, we have uh, a master Pi, which is the web server. Uh, it controls everything and distributes the jobs to the different builders and it hosts the wheel file. So every, every time you pip install something and it grabs a wheel file from, from pywheels.org, it's literally coming from that Raspberry Pi. Uh, there's a Postgres database that, um, so the master monitors PyPy and, and fills the database with all the, um, uh, all the information about all the packages and versions and what's been built and what hasn't. Uh, and that generates the build queue and tells the master what to tell the builders what to do. Uh, the builders are, um, you have multiple ones just so you can get through the, the queue quickly. Um, you have, we have uh, three on Raspi and Jesse for 3.4, two, two for Stretch and two for Buster for 3.5, 3.7. And if we need to uh, scale those up and down to, to deal with a, a, a large queue, or if we add, add a new ABI that we want to support, we can easily scale those up and down. Uh, we actually moved the database off of Pi because it, it was uh, hitting RAM restrictions once, we, uh, once things got more, more complex. Uh, so that's now running on a VM, but the rest of the whole thing is running on Pi's. Uh, when we go to build a package, uh, we first start by trying to build it on the lowest ABI, so uh, CP3.34M. Uh, Python 3.4. Uh, if that successfully builds uh, a pure Python wheel with a non-ABI tag, uh, then we don't need to do anything else. That one will work for everybody, uh, so we can move on. Uh, if it if it fails or it um, if it fails, we retry it on the next ABI just in case. Um, if it, if it succeeds but builds a, a platform wheel, so tagged with CP3.4M, then we have to trigger that one for a rebuild on the next uh, ABI, and then and so on. So uh, how, do, how do you use PyWheels? So uh, Raspbian is pre-configured to use pywheels.org as an additional index to PyPy. So uh, users get these platform wheels without, knowing, uh, without needing to do anything or change their behavior. Just pip install and using the, uh, the config that's provided here in the screenshot, that's, uh, that's enough to be able to use PyWheels. Um, so when you pip install SciPy, for instance, uh, it will say looking in uh, indexes pypy.org and pywheels.org. So if uh, if it finds the best match is in uh, is a wheel provided by PyPy, uh, sorry by uh, by PyWheels, then it will use that. Otherwise, it will fall back to PyPy, and they'll get the source distribution uh, as they did before. So it's not it's not getting in the way. So this is what uh, a simple index looks like. So PyWheels.org slash simple slash number. Uh, that should be SciPy. Um, 
uh, this is what it looks like. It's just, uh, this is what pip uses to uh, read what files are available. Uh, it's just a, a simple index. And then uh, the project pages, the exact same as uh, how uh, you, can, you can browse a project page on PyPy. You can read about uh, the versions available. Uh, this actually tells you specific information about which ABI um, build attempts failed and, and which ones passed uh, and any additional information. So how many downloads do we see from PyWheels? So uh, through 2018, we had uh, 5 million downloads and this is continu continuously growing. So in, through 2019, we had 9 million. And just, um, just so far this year, in the first nearly four months of uh, 2020, we've had 4 million downloads. Uh, to date, it's been 19 million. Uh, 1.2 million were in March. And we're, so we're pretty much over the 1 million per month mark. And to put that in perspective, yesterday there were 40,000. Um, and because we know how long it took us to build uh, each package, we, we also know how much uh, time we're saving because we know how much we can multiply by that, that by the number of downloads a package has. Um, so we can calculate that and we adjust it according to which, whether they want the, uh, ask for the V6 version or the V7 version, the amount of time would differ. Um, so we add all that up and it's really interesting to see. Uh, so again, through 2018, we saved, 40, saved users 42 years. And through 2019, we saved them 128 years, uh, and it's 250 years to date, uh, and 76 years so far in 2020. Put that in perspective, that's, uh, um, there were 22 years saved just in March this year alone, and yesterday, 262 days. There's actually a PyWheels Twitter bot which tweets all these stats sort of uh, either as we hit milestones or per day or at the end of the month, which can be interesting if you're interested. Um, dependency calculations are really, um, really important things. So uh, if you pip previously, if you pip installed something, even if it was from PyWheels, you might end up with this error, something uh, about I cannot add, cannot open shared object file. And people would be bemused as to what to do. So I wrote a blog post in 2018 about uh, how you get around this problem. Uh, you have to run a series of commands uh, to look at the SOs and, and, and try and resolve where, uh, which apt packages you need to install to be able to use this package. Um, so I wrote the blog post and it was getting loads of hits. So uh, we, we managed to automate that so that after a build is completed, uh, it, it logs in the database which packages, which apt packages are the dependencies for the user. And we put those on the project page. Uh, so just to, just to finish off, uh, what's next for PyWheels? So there's been some improvements in uh, the Simple Index API recently through uh, Python enha enhancement proposals. Uh, there's a new requires Python, um, attribute so you can specify even for pure python packages which versions of python uh, a package supports a file su supports and then there's a brand new uh, just this week uh, yank which is a, a kind of a soft deletion for packages uh, which we need to implement as well we've also got a, a json api so you can um, you can uh, look up package uh, information about which packages are available uh, and that's coming soon and there's always work to be done to fix any broken builds uh, next year, there'll be um, a probably three, Python 3.9 coming in, in Debian Bullseye. So uh, we'll have to work for that as well. And uh, just leave you with the, the links to uh, read more and, and if you want to get involved in the project. So thank you. Thank you very much. It was a lovely Thanks, Ben. Time. It's much better now, Jill. Thank you, Ben. Great. Thanks. I was even wearing the, the, Pi, the, the Raspberry Pi t-shirt, but now people can't see it. So, it's, so no, it's your should we move forward then? Yeah, <laughs> this is so awkward the, here. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Yeah, it's time for the next speaker, Jill. All right. So we have Mark Smith. Uh, Mark Smith, do we Hello have again? you? Hello again. Hello. <laughs> um, where are you Edinburgh. swimming from? Edinburgh, Scotland. Great. Uh, so, Mark, to go anywhere. tell us. Are you not? <laughs> <laughs> I will share my screen, excuse me. Go for it. Tell us everything, everything about MongoDB. Okay. Um, so, hopefully you can see my slides. Yeah? Yes, yes, yes. we can. Awesome. Excellent. I'm going to have to go quickly because I've got eight myths to get through in 10 minutes. So I joined MongoDB in December and I, before then I've worked with MySQL, Postgres, SQLite, Redis, CouchDB, Solar. And as I've learned more about MongoDB, what I've really learned is that 
everybody on the internet is wrong about MongoDB and its feature set and how it behaves. So I decided to um, give this talk and maybe clear some things up. So myth zero um, really relates to this video that's on YouTube where two dogs have an argument about uh, MongoDB. I think they're dogs. Um, one of them thinks that MongoDB will solve all of the problems that have ever existed in software development. Um, and the other one tries to inject some reality into the first dog's opinions about MongoDB. Um, it's genuinely really funny. It's 10 years old um, and uh, it's really, really out of date. We've released a lot of versions since then and completely changed uh, the, the, all, all of the feature set of the product. Um, so, but the first myth really is that you think we haven't seen this on YouTube. And it turns out that everybody at MongoDB has seen this. And in fact, we've seen it, we've bought the t-shirts um, and you'll find people around our head office walking around with laptops with stickers with this character on. Um, we're generally uh, kind of, you know, we find it as funny as everyone else and uh, we're big fans. So before really telling people what MongoDB isn't, um, I thought it was worth just giving a very, very quick overview of what MongoDB is. Um, and that is, it's a clustered database. So if you don't want to lose data, you need a minimum of three machines um, and there will be one primary and the others will be secondaries and you will only ever talk to the primary generally. Um, everything you save to the primary will be streamed to the secondary machines for to allow you to do zero downtime upgrades and for failover. So if the primary goes down, secondaries still have a, a hot copy of your data and one of those will be elected to be a new primary and hopefully your site continues as if nothing's happened and then you can sort out what's wrong with your cluster in your own time. Um, each of those databases stores collections of documents. So instead of tables like you store in a relational database, we have these hierarchical documents. Um, so the things to point out here are, this is a record from uh, our movies data set and it's just an interesting record. Like a, it's a one minute video from eight, a one minute movie from 1893. So it's like a 130 year old YouTube video, which I thought was kind of awesome. Um, so it's got a cast which consists of two people in a subarray. Uh, the IMDB rating is really what we call a sub document, but we might think of as a, as a dict or an object in Python. Um, and this is what comes back in Python from this um, query. You'll notice there's some types in here that can't be represented in JSON. So there's an object ID at the top, which is um, kind of, you can break down into uh, to get other attributes out of it. Um, and the date time um, further down the bottom is a timestamp object that, that um, works natively with Python. And I'll be more about those in a moment. So the first real myth about MongoDB is it, that it's at version 2.4. If you install Debian Jesse and apt install MongoDB, you get version 2.4. Um, this is seven years out of date. The current version is 4.2. We've made seven or eight major releases since then. We've completely rewritten the storage engine and there's a bunch of features in the newer versions that um, just didn't exist back in the day of 2.4. Um, so uh, yeah, if you want to install MongoDB, do not apt get it, do not yum install it. Um, Google MongoDB community and follow the um, instructions on the MongoDB website. Uh, you'll get the latest version um, and we package it for all the major Linux distributions and for Mac OS and for Windows. The second myth is so pervasive that even the MongoDB documentation sometimes refers to MongoDB as being a JSON database. MongoDB is not a JSON database. It does store documents that are kind of equivalent to JSON, but in fact, it's a BSON database. BSON is a binary um, data format that's kind of analogous to JSON, but um, storing structured data in text in a database would be silly. Instead, um, this is much more compact, uh, much easier to diverse so we can be performant. Um, it also, as I mentioned before, supports some extra data types. The interesting ones are the ability to efficiently store binary blobs, date times, decimal numbers, and other numeric types. JSON just isn't rich enough um, for the kind of data our customers are storing. Third myth is that we don't have transactions. Um, this really, uh, uh, people will talk about MongoDB as being a base database. Base stands for basic availability, soft state, and eventual consistency. And while this is true, and it is the main way you will access your data um, and use your database with MongoDB, because we have these rich documents and they can store kind of hierarchical data, whereas in a, a relational database, you'd store that across tables. So you kind of require transactions to update data across those tables consistently. Um, usually uh, updates to documents are atomic by themselves. They always have been. And so providing you're working within a document, um, you can just use the standard paradigm. 
um, and your, your data will be consistent within that document. Um, two years ago, we added transactions. Um, one year ago, we added transactions across sharded clusters. So now if you need to do multi-document transactions, um, even across a sharded database, we have that ability. So if anybody says it doesn't have transactions, they're just out of date. Um, the other thing people will say, myth number four, is that we don't have relationships. So although we do tend to contrast ourselves with relational databases, um, we do have relations, relationships. You can um, have documents that relate to other documents. Now that we have transactions, you can update them atomically as well. Um, yeah, there's just, there's just nothing stopping you from doing this. Um, you use a type of query called an aggregational query. It's incredibly rich and allows you to pull in data from multiple collections, uh, multiple documents, and return it as a single result. The fifth myth is that people um, will instantly talk, start talking about sharding when they talk about MongoDB. It's been a core feature from the very beginning. Um, it used to be how you scaled across a multi-core processor because we had the equivalent of a global interpreter lock that stopped you from getting efficient um, use of a multi-core machine earlier on. Um, as I say, we rewrote our storage engine to, to a non-blocking form of storage engine um, a few years ago. Um, and now the only reason you would shard is if you've got so much data, you can't store it on a single drive um, and uh, or if you want to store parts of your data local to different users who might be accessing your cluster. So the reason for not sharding is that you have a minimum cluster of three if you've got one shard. As soon as you add a sh second shard, you need another three machines at least for that second cluster. And you also need shard servers. You need two of those for high availability. You might need some load balancers on top of that. So you're actually um, probably tripling or quadrupling the cost of your cluster just by sharding. So in general, we recommend that people just buy a bigger machine. Performance is generally about storing stuff in RAM, having faster multi-core processors um, or a larger disk. So if you can do that, just upgrade the machines in your cluster um, and if you want to do that easily if you want us to take that problem off your hands um, we have this atlas hosted server that because i work for mongodb i recommend that you use it takes all the pain of managing um, a mongodb cluster away from you six myth um, is that uh, mongodb is insecure there have been lots of breaches uh, mongodb used to allow you to connect to a network port with no user authentication on your database so anybody who connected to that port could have access to all your data um, people would stick this in an aws instance open it up they would actually have to work quite hard to open up that network port um, on their ctu ec2 instance um, and then uh, people on the internet would find the open port connect to the database and then steal all the data um, we have always used industry standards such as TLS and Scramshar 256. Um, we, we use industry standard security. We've since worked with the Linux distributions to try and um, lock down the default installations of MongoDB. Now it's very difficult to put an unsecured instance of MongoDB on the network. It will usually bind to your local host port unless you really work very hard to make it available um, in an insecure form. Myth number seven is that MongoDB loses data. Everybody's heard this. Um, and again, it comes back down to bad defaults. Um, so originally MongoDB used to have a write concern of zero, which meant that if you were storing to a cluster and you sent it some data, it would just say, yes, I received that data. It didn't mean that it was stored anywhere. It didn't mean it had been replicated to any of the secondaries. It was bad default. You, could, you should override it if you knew how MongoDB worked, but often people wouldn't. So now um, the default write concern is one, which means it's been at least um, inserted into the collection on the primary. We generally recommend that you use majority. Atlas uses majority by default, and that means that it's going to be on a majority of the machines in the cluster before you get an acknowledgement saying that the data has been saved. So it really has been saved. Um, if MongoDB wasn't durable, um, really it, uh, it wouldn't be used by banks around the world. Um, and it is, such as Morgan Stanley and uh, Barclays off the top of my head. And really, the myth of, of all of these, the thing that they mostly have in common is that MongoDB is really easy to use. And yes, MongoDB is really easy to start to use. Um, but uh, if, like any other database, it's a large and complex product. And it, if you, uh, when you start using it with small data sets with simple use cases, it's going to be easy. Gradually, as you get more complex use cases, um, larger data sets, you want to scale it out and use it in, in more complex ways, you're going to need to know more about it. We provide um, rich documentation. We've got a, a, a bunch of courses called MongoDB University that allow you um, to get up to speed on the complexity of MongoDB and keep up to date with it as time goes on. Um, and so I. 
that's kind of all my myths. I'd like to just quickly um, pitch a project that I've been working on recently where we have an open hosted MongoDB database um, of the uh, John Hopkins University um, COVID-19 data set. So if you want to play with some interesting data or learn something about COVID spreads, um, this is a really interesting way to do that. You can build products on it. Um, yeah, so check out that URL. I will paste it in a channel in a moment. Um, and now, hopefully, some of the stuff you know about MongoDB isn't wrong, probably. Thank you very much. All right, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> yes, just it's, weird, it's not awkward. Right? It's very <laughs> weird. It is. So are you disconnected? Uh, yeah. Oh, oh there, there it is. OK, so disconnected. Uh, where are you streaming from? Uh, from Poland. From Poland, great. Um, Krakow. All right, so let's kick this off. Uh, tell us why pseudo Python is a trap. Uh, so should I start right now, or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Go, go for it. There's no. Uh, I mean, sorry. just yeah. I can, I can deal with the awkward, awkward timing. Um, does anyone know mm. any tractor jokes? I'm Let kidding. me know if you can, can you see my can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes, yes, I can. Go for it. Good luck. Uh, okay, so I'm disconnected and I'm going to speak about pseudo Python as a trap, use isolated mode. Uh, so few words about me. Uh, I am a security engineer at Trail of Bits. Uh, I also have a blog in the internet, which is at disconnected.pl. Uh, I'm also a reviewer at PageLab Institute, which is a free internet magazine uh, that I recommend you to look at. And I also play Capture the Flag competitions, which are security-related competitions, uh, and I play in Just Cut the Fish uh, CTF team. Okay, and the main goal of my talk uh, is to answer a simple question, uh, which is, is running pseudo Python in attacker controllers directory safe? So this could be, for example, a directory where uh, you where you as an attacker can upload files and then an administrator of a server runs pseudo python in that directory and so an obvious problem here is imports so for example if the administrator would do import request in the directory and we can see it here so here i have some directory that has two files that uh, we'll look uh, later at and if i try to do pseudo python free and then import requests, then uh, the request library is basically loaded and it's okay. But then uh, if an attacker could create a file called request.py in this directory with this given content uh, where we actually print a hello world and then we import OS module and then we execute os.system with the netcat program uh, with some particular uh, options to, to, to make it to launch bin bash and forward this to the uh, localhost 4444, which is an attacker controller server in our case. So uh, I'm going to spin up the server on the on the other co uh, console here. Uh, so yeah, on the bottom we have uh, the attackers console and on the top is the up uploads directory, for example. So here now we have this request.py and if we execute sudo python free and then import requests, this will actually execute the payload that was uh, provided into this request.py script and the attacker can actually execute any commands uh, on our uh, server. And here, as you can see, I can still uh, use any expressions in this Python. I, I can even close it and the attacker is actually still there because uh, this process was run in the background because of this unperson here. Uh, but this is a simple case uh, because we, uh, we, are all, we are all aware, all aware of uh, imports. Uh, and just to clarify, there are more uh, cases of imports, for example, the PyCache directory where you can put the TYC files uh, or the, uh, you, can, you could also create like the directory of the module itself and then provide the dunder init file. Uh, and all of those would execute this code uh, from an attacker. So the question is, what if we don't import anything actually, or if we import any modules that are uh, like, the built-ins, then if we uh, import the built-ins modules, the, the files uploaded by the attacker won't be executed. Uh, but there's another case, which was described in the uh, in Python back tracker uh, on the issue 12238. Uh, and this issue is about readline module loading in interactive mode. And 
this issue has been actually created on 2011. So it's open for, it's still open, it's not fixed uh, since nine years. Uh, so let's see what is it about. Uh, so if I come back to my console and I restart the attacker's server, uh, here I have a file uh, called main.c and uh, I have a simple uh, C code here. Uh, so here I have an init function which will execute a very similar payload to the one that we have seen previously. And this function is like marked with this attribute constructor thing. And this is a GCC specific thing and GCC is a compiler for the C language. And this basically says that if we compile this file as a shared library, uh, then this, and then any program would load that library, uh, then whenever this library would be loaded, this function would be executed. So the catch here is that if we actually create this shared library with GCC main C, with the shared flag, and we create it with this particular name, so readline.cpython, uh, the version of the Python, uh, the operating system, and then SO for shared library, and then we have this uh, shared library here, which you can see with the file utility. So now if we try to ex execute sudo python3, uh, then as we can see, our payload was executed once more. We, we got backdoored. Uh, we can still put any expressions here and the attacker can actually execute any command on our system. Uh, so, uh, Oh, since I haven't said that, the readline thing uh, is a library that is being used by the Python interpreter to like provide the history of the commands uh, and things like that. Uh, and it's all written in C, so that's why it's loaded as a shared library. Uh, so this slide shows the, the steps I have, I, I have so shown you uh, in the console as well. And uh, the case here is that this issue can be mitigated uh, by the isolated mode or, or flag in the Python interpreter. And this isolated mode uh, can be provided by the, by the minus uh, capital I uh, uh, flag. Uh, and it says uh, in the Python help that it isolates Python from the user's environment. And it says that it implies the minus E and minus S uh, flags. And those are ignore Python environment variables. And also don't add user side directory to syspath. Uh, so uh, we can actually see it in the console if I execute this once more. Uh, so I'm starting the server for the attacker again. And now I will do sudo python3 uh, minus the isolate mode. Uh, then we, we don't see this payload being executed here and the attacker doesn't have any control. And also if I try to import the request library, uh, this will also not execute the request.py file uh, that, that is being provided in this, in this directory. Uh, so uh, please be careful whenever you're executing pseudo Python, especially in some uh, directory that is being controlled by an, uh, by an attacker and use isolated mode for that uh, because you might be backdoored this way. And that's all, thank you. If you have any questions, reach me out either here or on Discord. Thank you very much, disconnected. Thank you. Are you creating a channel on the Discord to talk about your talk? Uh, yeah, I can create a channel. Amazing. Uh, it was a really cool talk. Like, yeah, I didn't know about this bug, or maybe it's a feature. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I believe it should be mitigated uh, since you know it's kind of a, a backdoor way. Uh, I, I saw someone like mentioned inside the uh, inside the bug. Thing, uh, which was Christian Himes, uh, which sadly I think is not here today, uh, <laughs> but it's like the security guy. So I think we have, we are like five minutes ahead or yeah. no, no, the opposite actually. No, 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 it's true. Yeah, five minutes ahead. Okay, cool. So is Marcus around? Yeah, Marcus. Yes, around. I am. Okay. Boom, there you are. Jill, do you have any tractor joke? No, I mean, I, I already used the, the tractor joke before, right? I, I have, I have a, like snake jokes. Oh, do you have snake jokes? I do, but, but it, it feels awkward because nobody, I, I can't see people's reaction. <laughs> what, what would you call a snake, like a three meters long snake? A python? Exactly. Oh, uh, you know, you know that one. <laughs> yes.
Um, yeah, that's yeah, that's the one that I had. I only had one. Okay, I mean, it, it will be nice to uh, to get like the feedback from the participants on the Discord channel, especially about the, our streaming infrastructure. Uh, so if the connection between Zoom and YouTube is working well. I know we just had an issue uh, during band talks. I can hear you better now. It's a bit oh. older. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Oh, Alex, Marcus, I think you were a bit... Yeah, I'm there. <laughs> I have so a... We still have yeah, two so or the YouTube. Minutes. Oh, you want to say the, something yeah, else? Yeah, we YouTube? do. Yeah, the YouTube stream got broken. Uh, we resent the links. I hope everybody got it. I sent it to e by email as well. And I have a Czech Norris joke. <laughs> Go for Please. it. Czech Norris doesn't need try and catch. Exceptions are too afraid to raise. Oh, this was a good one. <laughs> Marcus, how was your pizza? I didn't have one yet because the picture joint has, wasn't open yet. So oh. I'll get one this evening. Okay, cool. And yeah, I guess you're streaming from Berlin, right? Yes, I am. Okay. The weather is lovely today, you know? Eh, bit of overcast, but okay. <laughs> most, mostly it's, it's fairly warm. It's nice yeah. spring. Maybe not in my neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you streaming from, Marcus? Berlin, Germany. Berlin. Like almost half the conference speakers. Yeah, I don't know why. As it feels like. <laughs> <laughs> Should I start sharing my screen? Yeah. yeah can, what, yep. what, what is what is the Python developer's favorite topping, though? Like mine specifically, or? Uh, just like general Python developers. Since you're a Python developer, it should be the same. Piperoni. <laughs> <laughs> All hands on deck. Go for it, Marcus. Well, building a service that unintentionally exposes millions of people of data um, or user records is kind of easily done in today's time. And in this talk today, I want to give you a bit of an insight in who is going to be involved when that happens on the side of who needs to deal with the incident. So. My name is Marcus Holterman. I'm an engineer at Crate.io, and I'm also a member of the Django security web framework, uh, Django security team on the Django web framework. And well, I want to start this talk with a short story that you're probably familiar with to some degree. This is a, is a picture of the RMS Titanic on April 10th, 1912, which is when it was leaving the port in Southampton on its maiden voyage to New York City. And at that time, the Titanic was the largest ocean liner and had about 2,200 people on board. Four days into the journey on April 14th, at about 9 a.m. ship time, that was somewhere in front of the, uh, just before the coast of the Americas, um, they met this following message made it to the ship and was came from another steamship, um, Caronia. Westbound steamers report bergs, growlers, and field ice. And a few hours later at 1.42 p.m., another message made it to the ship, this time from the steamship Baltic. Greek steamer Athenia reports passing icebergs and large quantities of field ice today. And captains, um, the captain of the boat, Captain Edward Smith, um, acknowledged both messages. Um, but it wasn't particularly uncommon for those for, for ice in that area at that time of the year. So he didn't really consider this a big issue. Additionally, ice or icebergs weren't um, considered a big risk for ocean liners of that size um, at that time. So he, Captain Edward Smith, kept going as, well, being aware there is ice, but nothing major to, to worry about. And however, throughout the day, four more messages were received by the radio operators on board the Titanic. Just shortly after the, the second one, um, America passed two large icebergs. At 7.30 p.m., three large bergs fell five miles southward of us. And then at 9.40 p.m., the 
ice report, so much heavy pack ice and great number of large icebergs, also field ice. So these three messages got lost and never made it to the bridge. And one of the reasons for that is that the radio operators were busy uh, processing a backlog of messages from the, from the days prior. Also, the radio operators weren't more meant for passenger to, to help passengers on the ship communicate with, the, with others and less for, the, for, for inter-ship communication, if you want to call it that, like that. And then the sixth me message was, shut up, shut up, I'm working Cape Race, which is when the radio operator on duty at that time got so fed up with yet another message that was disturbing him from processing a backlog that he just like shut up the operator on the other side. And Cape Race is a radio station um, on shore fairly close by at that time. And then at 11.30 p.m. that operator went to bed. Now 10 minutes later at 11.40 p.m., just after sighting an iceberg right ahead, the Titanic hit its starboard. And then over the next two hours and 40 minutes, more and more water made its way into the hull of the Titanic. The Titanic sank at 2.20 a.m. just over 180 years ago on April 15th, 1912, killing more than 1,500 people. Now, not as dramatic is receiving a notice of a possible security issue these days in a tech company or department. Usually nobody's life is on the line, but it may very well be in the case for example, hospitals. And so top support teams at companies receive several messages a day that's for, from, from companies, from other people that, that need help with the software or um, their product. And they need to support, um, go through all these messages and triage them and, and figure out if it's a regular request, if it's a spam, is it a, or a report of a possible security issue. And when they try the issue, they need to make sure that they forward it to the correct teams. So security issues will probably go to a security team or maybe project managers or product managers. But the problem is when the um, triaging of those bugs or messages is not happening or not happening correctly, then this potential security issue is just going to pile up next to all the other bugs or bug reports that are coming in. So the project and project managers will need to budget and plan for engineers to work on a problem, but that report might also be dedicated to a dedicated security team that will do a more in-depth analysis of the whole problem and will then communicate with the corresponding um, teams or product, project managers. And once assessed, if there's an immediate workaround that mitigates the issue in the short term, well, then all current customers should probably be informed of it. And they should also probably be informed of how that workaround works or how they can implement that. And that is going to involve key account management or customer support again. And then when the de well, developers come up with a security fix for the issue, other parties in the engineering department will need to get involved as well. There's going to be testing and quality insurance, there are technical writers, documentarians, and whoever else in the company that is involved in any regular release. Um, and then most of those positions so far are part of the, what's commonly referred to as the engineering department. But they're not the only ones involved. Because when we look at proprietary products where customers usually need to pay for an update, well, the sales department needs to get involved and decide if they are going to hand out the update for free or if they are still going to charge customers for the update despite of the security fix. And then product managers in conjunction with the, um, with the sales department need to figure out how far backport, they backport the a security release for customers that are still running on older versions. And then imagine one of those leaks that exposed millions of user records. That's a PR nightmare. And the public relations office is going to have a, their hands full in f dealing with that. And when the marketing department had a product, came up with a product slogan in the past that was um, something along the lines of your secure thingy, well, they probably should think about another one fairly quickly because that one could quickly become a mockery. And then furthermore, the legal department is going to be involved 
because the data protection officers will need to talk to the authorities and inform them about the leak. And then in case of a production company, if the bad press about the issue causes sales of a product to go down, well then the purchasing department should probably think about reducing the number of purchased parts that they then use to manufacture the product. So what we can see here is that there's a whole bunch of things that, that, that relate here. While standards, requirements and guidelines are a great thing, they can also be incomplete or inadequate. When we think about the Titanic, um, at that point, British vessels over 10,000 tons needed to carry 16 lifeboats. The Titanic carried 20 in the requirements, but the lifeboats only provided space for 1,178 people. Just about half the number of people that were on board the Titanic. And only the third of the total numbers of people fitting on the Titanic. But that wasn't a big problem in that sense because the, at that time, as initially mentioned, um, ocean liners weren't considered a big, at, at big risk with icebergs and whatnot. And also because lifeboats were meant to get people off the ship onto another one that was close by and certainly not to carry um, 2,000 people at the same time for more than two hours. And in today's world, we can compare that for, to, for example, sending tans via mobile or SMS for mobile banking. Um, just because everybody does it, it's not particularly a good thing to do. And then we need, we realize that practice makes perfect because the officers and the, um, the crew on board were completely baffled by the incident and were not particularly equipped with the skills to deal with the problem at hand. And it's being said that Captain Smith was paralyzed when he grasped the enormity of the problem. Translating that into the tech world means we need to train ourselves for the case of insecurity incidents. That means we need to document the procedures and we need to practice them and try them out in order to be able to deal with them and not um, act in any irrational way. And then lastly, um, it's probably important that communication is crucial. And it's been said and uh, seen that the communication on board and the instructions that were given by the captain in, when the order was to uh, abandon the ship wasn't clear. Some officers put women and children into lifeboats, others let um, seats in the lifeboats empty because they misinterpreted something the captain said. And then two resources that we're going to quickly put in here. On the one hand side, it's the Oceanus magazine, which goes in fairly depth in the whole analysis of the uh, Titanic incident. And the other one is Agile Application Security, which is a book um, on how to implement security or security teams in an agile development environment. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. And I just Thank realized you. that the picture here is obviously not the best one at this current time. I mean, sure, you should all <laughs> talk together, but yeah, maybe not put your hands together, like lit physically, literally. P pretend they are washed. Yes, that's a good point. <laughs> all right. Um, there's Vincent, a talk. I... There's, the, there's a channel, um, hands on deck, oh, yes. if you want to discuss stuff. A yellow. What's the name? Um, talk dash hands on deck. Boom. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Vincent, where are you? I'm here, I Boom. think. Great. I will click. Yes, the yes you are. At I least I can. The... <laughs> I'm clicking the um, share screen button right now and practicing my webinar voice. Great. It sounds amazing. It's like radio voice. Is it the same? Uh, well, I don't know, it's just my voice, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I have a pretty good mic, I guess. Like, that's true. Where are you streaming from, Vincent? Uh, I'm in between Amsterdam and the beach. Wow. Sounds Amsterdam. amazing. Yeah, that's a good place where to be, I think. <laughs> so the, uh, the beach, yeah. yeah it will be epic. That will be epic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So tell us about what Roman numbers, API design, and word embeddings have to do together. Yeah, so um, 
First off, uh, hi, my name is uh, Vincent. I'm the research advocate at Raza. Um, and Raza is a company that specializes in the technology to make chatbots. And my job is to help the research team uh, such that our community understands all the algorithms that we're making, but also NLP in general. And uh, I think it was last week when we open sourced a tool, and I would like to talk about that. In particular, how it got inspired by Roman numbers. Um, so it's going to be a bit of a segue, but from Roman numbers, we're going to get to word embeddings. Um, because I believe that Roman numbers are the reason the Roman Empire fell. I've drawn a few Roman numbers here, and there's a couple of weird inconsistencies. So for example, if you have like times an X, that's 30, but then if you want to have 40, that's XL. And, you know, they're numbers. You have a representation of numbers. It's, it's an API. It's fine. Um, but the fact that there's no notation for zero really means that you can only use these Roman numbers for addition and subtraction. Um, and if addition and subtraction was the enterprise use case in a Roman era, that's fine. But if you were now to compare that to the decimal system, because we have a representation of numbers that uses this power of 10, you know, you can only have that if you have a zero, um, then, you know, with that representation of numbers, it's actually a whole lot easier to imagine powers of 10, uh, the square root, the logarithm, and all sorts of other things that helped us advanced science. Um, and there's a small lesson here that the API, the notation of it, that can really constrain ideas if you do that wrong. If you're designing an API for a very, very specific goal, then you're going to constrain creativity. So in general, especially for numeric libraries, it is my professional opinion that we should design expressive APIs that invite you to play as opposed to just implement a certain function. And that idea brought me to word embeddings. Now, if you're into data science, you probably have heard of these things. The idea is that you can map a word to a numeric representation. And <clears throat> very often you hear that king minus man plus woman equals queen. And you can get that arith arithmetic working uh, because of neural networks. And this is great, but some of the questions I have with these word embeddings is that I wonder if this always holds, this relationship with king and woman. Because, um, you know, we have different languages out there and different vectorization algorithms and different data sets that you can train this on. And I mean, this is one type of analogy and there's other analogies and I'm interested in knowing if it always holds. And in particular, there might be a gender bias thing going on here. So I'd like to investigate that. And if you then look at tools that help you visualize word embeddings, then I'll just take this example from TensorFlow. I mean, yes, it's 3D. And yes, it's showing word embeddings, but to me, this is a Roman visualization. This is not something that is really helping me understand. Yes, it's a plot, but I can't play with it. It's not expressive. So I think this is the wrong tool for what I'm interested in. So instead of dreaming about what the end tool should look like, let's instead draw some diagrams of stuff that you can do with word embeddings. And let's just make sure that our API has that. So mathematically, embeddings are just vectors. And if you might remember from your physics textbook that vectors are these things that you can subtract from each other and vectors are these things that you can add together. And you can kind of wonder, what does it mean if I do king plus man minus woman, right? But there's some other operations too. In particular, what you can do is you can say, hey, I wanna have my vector A plot away from B. Yeah, it's a bit of a linear algebra. I don't want to get into the formals, but that's also an operation that you can do with word embeddings. You can project away. And another thing that you can do is you can project onto. You can also say, look, I'm interested in knowing uh, what the relationship of A and B is by checking how big of a scope A has on B. And the idea then is, is this is a matplotlib plot that comes out of the package but you can totally have embeddings plot that way. So I can show you what queen minus king looks like. And I can also show you what man projected away from queen minus king might look like. And if you start thinking about, hey, these are fun operations to have, then you can overload some operators and then Python is kind of a nice language to go ahead and implement this in. So this got me thinking, this is a pretty cool trick. But how are you going to do this for higher dimensions? Because everything I've just done is just two dimensional. 
Well, here's a trick. Let's pretend that these three vectors are super high dimensional, like 300 dimensions or something. Well, then I can always do this. Let's say I'm interested in knowing how much of B is expressed in A and how much of B is expressed in C. Then I can map B onto both vectors and just measure how much of the area is, uh, is sort of covered. And the thing that's interesting about this, if I now give a name to these vectors, let's say one of them was queen, one of them was king, and the other one was fire hydrant, then I think it's plausible that king and queen have a bit more of an overlap. But the nice thing here is, is even if these are super high dimensional, I do now have an X axis and a Y axis that I can chart in two dimensions. This idea is the basis of the what lies package. I wanna have flexible operations and plot those. I don't wanna have like a single chart. I want you to be able to play with this. So it's a playful tool to figure out what lies in word embeddings. And I'm gonna give you a super short demo of it right now. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, here's a bunch of words and let's just get the spacey language model running and let's just get the word embeddings from spacey. And I've got words like prince, princess, etc. And then I can make an embedding set. And it's kind of like a data frame, but for embeddings. And what I can then do is I can say, hey, let's just plot that entire set of embeddings with regards to king and man. And the nice thing about this chart, it's an Altair chart. So it's fully interactive. So you can sort of zoom in and see where clusters of words appear. And you can see that uh, you know, there's a kind of a cluster here with princess, king, and queen, and uh, you can kind of play with it. Another thing that I also allow you to do is I allow you to apply a transformation on that embedding set. For example, if you take the PCA transformer from our library, we will calculate the principal components that you can then plot, and you can also plot uh, based on the principal components themselves. And this makes the cluster even more apparent. What I can also do is I can make an attempt at debiasing. I can say, hey, there's this meaning from man to woman, and I wanna project my entire embedding set away from that meaning. This will give me a new embedding that I can also visualize. And the funny thing is, because this chart is an Altair chart, what I can do is I can chain two Altair charts together to get two charts next to each other. That's what this pipe operator does. And then you can get an impression of, hey, what, does, what is actually happening when I apply this transformation? Now, there's a bit of movement in these two charts and it's a little bit complicated to see what actually changed. So what we also allow you to do is say, hey, we've got one embedding set and we wanna compare that to a new embedding set. And in this particular case, you can see that woman and man, before they were in a different space, but after the transformation, they mean the same thing. They're pointing to the same word now. And we can zoom in and notice that nurse and doctor are now also closer together. And this is a fun zoo of things that you can do to word embeddings. And that's the stuff I like to support here. Finally, what I think was one of the coolest features to make is I can also say, hey, is king minus man plus woman, is that equal to queen? And it turns out it isn't. It's actually equal, it's more equal to king than to queen. Um, you can calculate these distances yourself. We also support many similarity metrics for word embeddings. We're still working on extra features for this. It is a little bit more of a playful tool than something that's actually in production right now. But one of the features that we currently have is also support for sentences. And especially we are able to support BERT embeddings such that you can say, hey, I wanna have the embedding for Python in the context of this sentence, as opposed to that one and that will just go ahead and work. We have a DSL that we can play with here. So this has been a super, super quick overview of what the What Lies package does. And this is one of the things that I'll be working on uh, on behalf of Raza to help people understand word embeddings a bit better. We, we really care that people understand NLP. Currently we support SenseDefect Spacey and a couple of Hugging Space models. Um, we have PCA, UMAP, and all sorts of other transformations and many plot types. And pretty soon I'm expecting that we support all hugging face models as well as fast text vectors. That's stuff I'm currently working on. And while I have you here, one thing that is also worth mentioning 
uh, I'm currently paid uh, full time uh, to make sure people understand algorithms. So what you can go ahead and do is you can go to the, in Google, type in Raza algorithm whiteboard, and you'll find a YouTube playlist uh, of just me and a whiteboard explaining all sorts of algorithms. If there's a NLP algorithm that you would like to see explained, reach out to me and I'll gladly make content for you. What I hope though, is that I've inspired you to think about these Roman numbers and to also look at your code base and wonder, well, is this solving the right problem or is there an opportunity here to become a little bit more expressive? Because more often than not, it's probably possible. I, I, I don't know how much time I have left. I don't know if this was 10 minutes. <laughs> It, it, yeah, it was. Yes, it oh, was exactly cool. 10 minutes. Yeah. Sweet. Okay, uh, that's everything I wanted to say. Uh, if someone could explain to me how to make a thing in a Discord, I'll gladly talk to people there. Uh, just, just press the, the plus button on the, you see? That's an upload though. Where is it? Oh, wait, I, I think I can do it. Okay. Boom. I'll, I'll, see, I'll, I'll, I'll see you there, Vincent. Yep. Thanks. Thanks for the, Thank for the talk. No worries. Thank you. Do we have Alexander? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. I like uh, that you dressed up for the for the conference. Yeah, uh, of course. Uh, Sharp suit, dude. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm gonna share my screen here. Let's you share. Yeah. You, you still screen. have time, though. Oh uh, yeah. Have okay. Time. So um, do, yeah. Uh, do, do, do you want to start screen? straight away or? Uh, it doesn't matter for me. Uh, I, I put up links to my slides and stuff in, in my channel. So if someone wants to follow along, they can do that there. So you already have a channel. Yeah. Talk Pydantic. Uh, so uh, I just, and post where, where are you streaming from? I'm streaming from Sweden, Gothenburg. Oh, nice. I've never been there. Yeah. Uh, You'll have to come and visit sometime. It's it's a nice city. <laughs> <laughs> we have I, I really heard nice weather today. Yeah. Nice. Uh, yeah, but I'm ready to start whenever uh, whenever you want. Yeah. To, so let's go then. Let's go. Yeah. Uh, okay. So Pydantic. I'm gonna talk about Pydantic. Uh, in a talk named uh, "Give Your Data Classes Superpowers," and my name is Alexander Hogner. And uh, just a quick introduction about me. I'm the founder of Hogner Technologies. I'm a freelancing consultant. Uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I have an email. You can find all my slides on slides.com slash Hogner. There's most of the slides from other conference talks I've made as well. Uh, a quick outline. I'm going to have a quite high pace since it's a very short format, uh, but basically I'm going to talk about Pydantic. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the runtime type checking, about the nifty JSON uh, functions, about custom validators. I'm briefly going to showcase the fast API framework that heavily utilizes Pydantic. Uh, it's also built on the Starlet uh, library that uh, Lukas uh, talked about earlier, and uh, I'm gonna start with a quick refresher on Python data classes since that's what uh, we're gonna use initially. So let's start with a quick refresher. Uh, I'll use some pizza based examples in the spirit of the Python pizza conference. Uh, so here we have a pizza, and we have the, a style of pizza, and you can see we have toppings, and those are a tuple of strings. Uh, and if we try it out, we can make a pizza with style one, with cheese and ham, and it works like expected. So now maybe we want to constrain our offer more, and our pizzeria doesn't offer pineapple. Maybe you hate it or you love it, but that's how it is at our pizza place. So um, we had a enum class uh, for mozzarella, tomato sauce, prosciutto, basil, and rucola, which is the toppings we offer. And we change the type annotation to refer to toppings. And if we try this out now, uh, we can see that it's still uh, allowing us to create a pizza with pineapple topping. And I even added a integer topping just to show that it allows pretty much anything. So the types are not enforced in runtime. Uh, and this is where Pydantic comes in. So Pydantic is a great Python library 
very nice documentation. All the links in uh, the slides are clickable. So that's why I also shared the, the slides online. So you can easily um, find all those. Uh, and it allows you to do uh, data validation, runtime type checking, and a lot of different things. So let's get started. Uh, with data classes, uh, types aren't enforced, but with Pydantic, uh, we can just change the import to import data classes uh, from Pydantic instead, and just use the same uh, decorator. And now if we try the same code, we can see that we get a validation error and also a very nice error message. So uh, that's uh, one of the nifty features I really like because readable errors are great. And uh, now maybe we should try to create a valid pizza. Uh, so I'm gonna create a Napoli style pizza with tomato sauce, prosciutto, mozzarella and basil. And it works perfectly just like we want. So what about JSON then? Um, with the database uh, data class drop in replacement uh, decorator, we don't get to JSON support. But if we use the Pydantic base model instead, we do. Uh, and JSON support is first class. So let's see an example. Uh, we specify the arguments using keyword arguments now. And you can see now that we can easily encode the object as JSON using the built in JSON method on the object. Uh, which is really nice. So let's reconstruct our object from the JSON output. Very useful if you have an API uh, allowing mutation or something. Uh, so we'll use the parse raw function. And as you can see, it works and gives us the exact same object again. So next, what about the errors then? Uh, the validation errors were really nice and you can get them as JSON as well. So these are perfect if you want to expose this for an external consumer like an API. And JSON schema, you probably heard about JSON schema. It's uh, basically a schema for your JSON objects so you can have better validation. And Open uh, API and Swagger uses these for their specifications. And Pydantic have built in support for them. Uh, it's draft seven, which will be the standard in Open API 3.1, uh, just so you know. Um, and uh, that was the built-in validators, but what about custom ones? Uh, so now we're gonna have a bit more meaty example where we bake our pizza. So now we have baked the pizza and uh, want to make sure it's properly done. Uh, and we add an oven temperature and we also check the style. So it's one of our supported house styles, in this case, Napoli, Roman and Italian. And also we want uh, Napoleon pizzas ideally to be made with an oven temperature around 375 degrees Celsius. Uh, but we're gonna be a bit, uh, a bit more uh, nice and allow everything from 350 to 400. Uh, and if it's something else, we're gonna raise a value error. Uh, so that was a very basic example showing you both root validators for the entire object and a validator on a specific style property. Uh, and as you can see, this just extends the previous pizza model. Uh, so let's continue. Uh, now let's bake a pizza uh, that's invalid and see what happens. And as you can see, the pan pizza style wasn't liked by our pizzeria. It tells us that we should cook one of the following styles, Napoli, Roman, or Italian. Uh, so let's try a Napoli style pizza with an oven temperature of 300 degrees. And as you can see, it's neither uh, allowed and uh, you get an error saying it's not in the specified range. So these are very useful. Maybe you want to use these runtime type checkers on functions as well. In this case, Pydantic got you covered as well. This is still in beta and was just released last week. Uh, so. API may change, but basically you can use everything from, Py from Pydantic, all the validate arguments, uh, using the validate argument decorator, you can use all the Pydantic types, all the type annotations will work in the same way and you will get the same type of validation errors. So you can use them just like you did with the Pydantic models, which is very nice. And now let's go ahead to fa fast API. So, Fast API is a micro framework very similar to Flask uh, and uh, it adds some very nice uh, API uh, 
uh, functions such as automatically generating open API specs. It's very tightly integrated with Pydantic. So even though the portals are more, are very portable and can be used anywhere, they are especially good with the fast API. It's async ASCII based on Starlet. Uh, and this is all everything we need to make an API. So here we can make an order, we can uh, deliver, and we can deliver the pizza. And the built-in type checking will make sure that everything is correct. So this is just the beginning. Uh, it's a very brief talk, and uh, the, it's the tip of the iceberg. Uh, you can ask me in the chat or on Twitter or LinkedIn or via email if you're uh, interested and want to know more. But I'm just going to give you a hint of some of the other stuff that's supported. I'm not going to go into detail here because it's way too much to cover in this talk, but just so you've seen it. And all these links are clickable. and. Uh, you can get them uh, from the slides which are in my channel. Uh, so concluding, uh, we have a pure Python syntax, uh, but we have better runtime validation. Uh, we just use the standard type annotations. It's very useful to use for APIs with all the JSON tools. It's easy to migrate from your existing uh, data classes. Uh, you have a lot of useful features. More things are coming. It's very actively developed. They're working, for instance, on a strict mode that won't coerce things. And you should try it out if you're interested. Uh, and if you have any more questions, contact me in the chat or uh, through any channel uh, else. You can see the links here. I have a GitHub repository with all the stuff related to this talk. I'm also making a course on Hypothesis. So if you're interested in that, you can sign up uh, and I will give you an email once it's done. I'm available for training, workshops, freelance consulting, if you're interested. And that's my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Great talk. Um, yeah, so we got some time. Yeah. Marielle, are you here? I sure am. Can you hear me? So, yes, yes, it's a bit, it's not too loud. It's the opposite of loud. All right. Um, can you hear me better? <laughs> a little bit better, yes. All right, so we can just do this for two minutes. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, we, we, we have time, <laughs> so it's fine. Yeah, we, we can <laughs> test your, your, yeah. your setup, but uh, yeah, I mean, the sound is like you're talking for far away inside the room all right okay um so my mic's not ideal i guess but it's all i've got um we, we can hear you fine it's just all right all right so, so you think i can do a presentation with this volume yeah yeah maybe you can try yeah, to yeah. raise the volume directly inside um mm -hmm. hello inside zoom hello? Uh, there should be like uh if you click if you oh. click on the microphone they can we... uh -huh. Uh, mm -hmm. You can see audio settings. Yeah. And there you can set up the input volume. All right. Okay, I've maxed it out. Okay, that's cool. That'll, um, that'll improve. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's fine. People can just raise their volume. All right. My apologies, I don't have a fancy setup. Ah, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> they ran out of mics on, on, on Amazon. I tried. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I tried. I mean, among other things that are sold out, like flour and cocoa powder. And <laughs> so. Yes. Yeah. I, I really don't get this thing with microphone and toilet paper. It's crazy. Right. <laughs> In that combination, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, should I share my screen? I, um, what time? Yeah, I yeah, yeah. All right, cool. Share. So, because you're a coffee expert, uh, what sort of coffee did you have today? Um, I had coffee from Colombia. I, oh, uh, nice. Posted a photo nice. of my pour over setup. Um, yeah. So, let me know when it's time. Um, I mean, wh whatever, like, wh wh where are you shooting from? Um, the most unoriginal answer, Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I'm not in Berlin, so to me, it's very original. 
All right. Okay. At least ten other people said they were streaming from Berlin. <laughs> so. It's it's a cool city, Jill. You should move here. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, tell us then how to teach Python to beginners. Yep. Yeah, I'll do that. Hi everyone. This is a very quick guide for Python experts on how to teach Python to beginners. My name is Marielle, and I'm a data scientist based in Berlin, Germany. And before I was a data scientist, I was a researcher um, at the intersection between psychology, computer science, and educational sciences. Um, so today, I'd like to share a few things that I learned from that universe that you might find interesting, um, especially if you're teaching or mentoring in Python in some capacity. Let's start by talking about this guy. His name is Brett Victor. He is an interface designer and computer scientist who worked for um, places like Apple. And he wrote an interesting essay called Learnable Programming, in which he argues that most programming languages are actually not learnable for humans and are rather poorly designed. And here's what he had to say. Two thoughts about learning. He said that programming is a way of thinking and learning how to code is not the same as learning how to program. He also said that people understand what they can see and thus the goals of a programming system should be support and encourage powerful ways of thinking and to enable programmers to see and understand the execution of their programs. And then he gets, goes on to say that maybe it's just better to like develop an entirely new programming language that's actually learnable according to these goals that he proposed. Um, but that also got me thinking, how can we make Python learnable in this sense without having to reinvent its syntax or like creating an all new language altogether? So today I'd like to um, talk about two evidence-based instructional strategies that you can incorporate in your teaching um, that would make Python a bit more lear learnable according to the goals that Brett Victor um, proposed. And I use the term um, evidence-based instructional strategies to mean that, these that many like, research studies have been done on these strategies and they've been proven to work and are effective for learning. Um, and they are called dual coding, which is combining text um, or code plus images to introduce new information, and to use self-explanations in which you encourage your learners to explain to themselves how their code works. So first, we have dual coding. Um, dual coding works because we remember new information better when it's presented to us visually and verbally versus when it's presented only visually or only verbally. And that's because our brains store or encode verbal and visual information in different regions. So if you get the same information in two different formats, your brain now has two ways of remembering that information and that's why it sticks in your memory better. So um, I'd like to suggest that um, you try to find different ways of presenting abstract programming concepts visually and not just by showing the code. Um, and for this strategy, I have a great tool recommendation. It's called Python Tutor. And what you do with Python Tutor on pythontutor.com is that you enter like a Python code. So here I have a, a list, a tuple, a dictionary, and I've assigned um, this uh, variable, this list variable to another variable name. And what Python Tutor does is that it will show you exactly what happens when each line of code is executed. And so you see here all the objects um, that the code is created. And I really like how the list and the tuple, like the elements are here visualized in, um, separately and are separated by borders. But here for the list, you see that there's just a border here on the left and on the bottom. And for the tuple, you have like a border surrounding the entire perimeter of the visualization. And I think that's a really cool, subtle way of visualizing immutability and mutability. Um, and I also like how the dict visualization like shows key value pairs really well. And I like how um, it basically implies that data that's stored in dictionary can also be represented in tabular form. And that's really handy for when you're talking about data frames later. Um, and also finally, I'd li I really like how these um, like variable names, like you can see that they refer to the same object um, in this space. So use Python Tutor to show your like, beginner learners um, what's happening under um, Python, uh, under the hood. Uh, whoops, yeah. So how do I get back to my slides? Um, there we go. So yeah, Python Tutor really embodies dual coding really well. Use it. So the next strategy is called self-explanations. And self-explanations work because when you explain your information to yourself or to other people, um, this act is you actively making sense of what you just learned. That's actually why um, maybe you've heard 
the saying that teaching is the best way of learning. So um, yeah, even the expectation that you have to explain something is already an act of learning and act of understanding and making sense of, of information basically. And when you're learning something new, it's only natural to connect that new information that you're trying to learn to something that you've already learned before. And that's a really important exercise because connecting new information to old information is a surefire way um, to remember that new information and let that stick in your memory. And also that old information that you're relating to new information will serve as a great frame of reference to guide you in learning even more about that topic that you're trying to master. So for example, if you're new to pandas or you, you have a learner who's new to pandas, um, you should encourage them to relate um, or find similarities between pandas functions and Excel, um, if that's something that they've used before. It will help them flatten the learning curve, if I may use that really kindly reference. And self-explanations is a really great way of identifying knowledge gaps. Um, it's, yeah, a really great way of getting yourself unstuck. So if there's something that you're explaining out loud that you can't explain, um, then that means you might have to look back at that block of code or that topic and yeah, try to brush up your memory. Um, of course, self-explanations work best when you do it out loud in, or in writing and not just an internal monologue in your head. And experts recommend that learners do self-explanations alone before they try it out with their partners. Well, the thing about self-explanations is that it's a skill on its own, so beginners might not know how to explain things to themselves, especially if they're new to the topic and they don't have a ton of um, prior knowledge to relate the new information to. So as a mentor or a teacher, um, it's um, your job to, job to help them along by prompting them to make accurate self-explanations. Um, and this is a really great way as well to introduce proper or um, good documentation practices, because you can think of in-code comments as a way of self-explanations, a way of explaining how code works. And I think this strategy um, works well, not just with your own code, but with trying to explain other people's code as well. So uh, for this strategy, I recommend this great repository by um, Al Swigart. He's the author of Automate the Boring Stuff with Python. And what it is, it's a collection of text-based games written in Python 3. Um, like it was like hundreds of yeah, really simple games written in Python. And they cover all the basics of, of Python, like loops, um, the function definitions. And I really like the, the motivation behind it. He said here that what helped me learn to code was finding small projects whose source code I copied and then made small adjustments to. So that's an exercise that you can try with your learners as well. Um, and it's a great way to practice um, code using self-explanation. So here's a snippet of a code that um, is from that repository. And you can show this to your learners and get them to try to figure out the code. And you can encourage them by yeah, giving these prompts. So you can ask them to ask themselves the following questions. What output am I expecting? How, how do I know that that's the output? Or how does line X affect line Y? And what happens if I comment out this line? And Yes, how else, how would I code this program differently is also a great prompt for, yeah, for learning how code works. So some final words that I'd like to leave you with. So if you're already in a position of, of mentoring or teaching in Python, then you must already have a ton of content knowledge in Python. But maybe if you haven't had to think about your pedagogical content knowledge or how you, how best teach um, Python to, especially to beginners. I hope this talk will give you a bit of inspiration. Um, a great, where, great place to start would be to ask yourself, how can you make Python learnable? What are your goals? Brett Victor had his goals, but what are your goals um, for teaching Python? And lastly, I'd like to propose an alternative to learning by doing, which is learning by doing with intention. Um, and that intention to be, should be, in my opinion at least, to build a fundamental understanding of Python concepts. Um, because at the end of the day, we want our learners not to just build, I don't know, app after app or program after program without any intention. You'd like them to apply Python in meaningful ways. And hopefully these strategies um, are a good place to start building and developing that fundamental understanding. So that's it for me. Um, if you're interested in yeah, improving the way you teach Python or you mentor in Python, I'd really love to help. Um, I owe a lot of what I know 
in Python from the people who were really generous and friendly with me when I was starting out. So this is my way of sharing what I know and giving back. So I'm on Twitter, probably the best way to reach me. I'm also on the Discord channel. Um, yeah, my name is Marielle and I hope you like that and learn something and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Marielle. Love it. I agree with everything. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we got some, we got two minutes. Uh, Chuk, are you here? I am here, hello. I can actually start video, right? Hello? Yes, yes you can. Hello. <laughs> hello, Chuk. Hi. Yeah. I like the green background. Yeah, this Where is- Where are uh, you streaming from? My, oh. uh, you mean like here, I mean my bedroom, but <laughs> I, I'm, I'm based in London. Yeah, it looks like a studio, Great. but it's my bedroom, trust me. Um, yeah. Nice. Nice. It can be anything with the green background. Uh, you can, yeah, you can uh, be anywhere, but I just, I just love you seeing me with my green screen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, you know, I'm quite enjoying this conference. I usually don't like these conferences because they are, I don't know, video calls. I'm getting sick of them because working from home <laughs> Yeah. and meetings and yeah. But this is pretty cool. Uh, yeah. Drop on Discord, drop a message if you're liking this kind of conference. Well, I like it because like, I think I start to become like, I discover my nerdy side uh, of like in this uh, lockdown because I just love staying at home and connect with people <laughs> just by online, um, playing games, chatting in Discord and um, doing Zoom. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so, uh, All right, so we can start whenever you want. <clears throat> yeah, okay. So let me see if I can share my screen. It's always a challenge for me because uh, for some reason, uh, Zoom sometimes doesn't detect my screen, but this time it works. I hope you can see it all right, yeah? Yep, yep, we can. Yeah. How, That's good. how can we get Pythonic? Yes, uh, can I start now? Are you oh, counting? Yes. Are yeah. you starting the stopwatch? Okay, <laughs> right. So actually, I will start my stopwatches as well. So I'm Cherk. Uh, you feel free to grab the slides. Actually, I'll just post in the chat that that's the link to the slides. Just uh, grab the slides because this talk is short and there are a lot of details that I may go very quickly. So how to be Pythonic? And um, you know, it's, it's a question I ask when I design a query language in Python. So um, so yeah. I'm Shirk. Uh, so you already seen my, uh, you know, social media thing uh, in the first slide, or I will be hanging around after this. So uh, feel free to grab me on Discord. I will be hovering around channels. So give me a shout. Um, I uh, involved in a lot of open source projects that includes Terminus DB. That is the uh, the project that I work for full time at the moment. And I also involved in a lot of uh, community work, including you know help organizing um, your Python and London Python sprints. And recently, I am, hey, hi. <laughs> yeah, and recently, I'm streaming on Twitch. So I would actually stream a uh, Python, actually, every Sunday, a uh, Python uh, beginners tutorial um, at 1 p.m. UK time. And uh, also, there are other, like, uh, Python-related programs, uh, including interviews with, uh, you know, I just interview uh, Michael Ford, uh, the core dev of Python. And there will be more and more guests that uh, you maybe want to see them. So please follow me on Twitch. Um, so. Um, Back to the talk, uh, what does Pythonic mean? First of all, I need to know whether it is a thing or is it just a, you know, urban legend and myth. So I, actually I give this talk before at Pi Amsterdam. So at that time I have more time, I can do a polling, but now I can't. So I just show you the results previously. So 90% of people think that uh, Pythonic is a thing. So, okay, I look it up on Stack Overflow. So you can find anything on Stack Overflow. So somebody answered, I think it's a good answer. Pythonic means that the code doesn't just, you know, it's, it's syntactically right. It doesn't mean that you can't, you know, run it, but also you can, you know, it's beautiful. It's the, follow the convention that, you know, people in the Python community agrees. It's just about artistic uh, judgment. So it's not right or wrong. You can still run your code, but is it beautiful enough for people who is in the community to understand what you're doing? So for example, when I just started learning Python, I was doing pandas, I was working as a data scientist. Sometimes, you know, I have to do some operations like, you know, calling the methods in pandas. Pandas provide a lot of methods, but sometimes I don't get it. I don't, I don't understand. I was asking myself, why can't I just do it in a for loop? Well, 
you can do it in a for loop. Uh, for example, in C++ or Java, you can write a for loop like this to crawl through the list. But in Python, a for loop could look like this. Well, it's, you don't have to deal with the index. There's less er like less possibility that you make the off by one error. It's much easier for people to understand what you're doing. You can even write in one line. That's, that's really condensed and perfect. So this is Pythonic. This is the beauty of uh, Python and how do you actually um, use um, you know, the, the functionality of Python to uh, make your code easy to understand, easy to compose. Uh, yeah, uh, weekly Python lectures, I just see somebody asking. Uh, I will post the link afterwards. So um, design a query language in Python. So before I start doing this, actually, I will tell you why I, I, I did that. But, you know, before I do that, I need to know where the people, um, you know, what people think about query language. Do people like the most popular query language on the planet, SQL? So I am surprised that, like, you know, so many people like SQL. I personally doesn't like it because, um, you know, uh, well, it's, it's not a flexible query language. Sometimes you want to do some simple things. You have to aggregate, join it back to itself, aggregate again, and join it back to itself again. I don't like doing that. It's really like, it's like a puzzle to solve every time I w write a query language. So it all started when I become a developer of a card for Terminus DB. So I joined the team. Um, so Terminus DB is a graph database. So the, uh, the advantage of a graph database is that, for example, we have a table here. You've got some people's name, you got relations between people's father and mother, but it's actually difficult to understand who's, who's like, who's, for example, John's grandmother. You have to, in your mind, make it our map to find out John's, you know, parents and then uh, John's parents' mother. So, um, but if you are presented uh, with uh, with a graph, uh, with you know, uh, that's you know, it, it's very easy and it's also color coded. That you just look at it, you know that oh, Priscilla and uh, Sally is John's grandmother. So, um, what if the data itself is already in a format that you know you can just get the uh, the information intuitively? And you don't have to write, uh, you see, uh, SQL. So like, like I said before, you have to join again and, you know, like it's let and join, like it's, I don't like it. Uh, but in Terminus DB, we have this uh, Waco JS that this is in JavaScript actually. So uh, you can see that you can build a query language with uh, chaining different methods. And also, you know, you can declare variables in the query itself. So all these V colons are variables. It's very much like a programming language. So when I join a team, I think that, well, what if we have a Python version of it? Because Python is the most popular um, query language for, um, for data science and all this uh, data manipulation. And the team say, yes, let's do it. So that's great. Um, okay, so what is WacoPy? Um, first of all, you can pip install it. I think that's very important. Uh, it comes with our uh, Python clients because when you're using WacoPy, like the chances are you are using Terminus DB. So like you can actually call the client as well. So it's included everything, you just pip install it. Uh, also recently we added the functionality that you know, um, when you get the result, the query result back from Terminus DB, you can just use the functions to put it into a pandas data frame. So if you're a data scientist that you are actually um, doing other analysis or machine learning even afterwards, that's very convenient for you. Um, so it, let's you talk to the database, uh, data graph in Terminus DB in a Python, uh, Python program. So you can see that we have objects and you know you construct the query language and use the clients to talk to Terminus DB. Instead of writing this, so what is this? This is a JSON LD file. So the original format of Waco is actually JSON LD. This is how you know your front end client talking to um, the, the Terminus uh, you know, server, the back end itself. Uh, you don't want to write in JSON. I don't want to write in JSON. This is for machine. This is not for, for human. Um, so uh, now, because we will have a new version uh, of uh, Terminus DB, because we would have Hub, we would support functionalities, let you collaborate, let you branch and merge uh, more and more like it. So we also designed the client. And um, so I, I would like to know um, what people prefer. Um, do they prefer, you know, the old way of how we did things like, you know, you know, chaining different, um, you know, calls and create the query language that way. Or in my opinion, it's more like a, a pandas way of doing it. Just put all these options as a um, parameter. Well, this is the obvious choice, right? Things, uh, people prefer things more like pandas because 
is just more natural for people manipulating data with Python. So uh, there will be a lot of changes. I'm very keen to incorporate this change because this is what the community wanted. And I'm a very community driven person. So um, we are working hard on it at the moment. So, but there are also other challenges. For example, in JavaScript, uh, we have all these like logic things going on in the query. So you can use an as the name of a function. Um, so uh, wacko an. But in Python, no, you can't use an. An is keyword, so you can't use it as a function's name. So we have to add a prefix to it. It's not as smooth and condensed that I wanted, but that's the way of doing it. And it happens with other keywords as well. Um, but let's look into the future. So um, what is this? So this is actually a um, terminus console. So what it does is like a Jupyter notebook, right? So you call a query, it will give you the results like right after you execute it. And the good thing about it is also consists of a graph uh, representation. So you can actually show your um, data as the graph in the console. So that's actually a good thing that we would love to have in Jupyter Notebook because Jupyter Notebook is a very popular open source tool for um, uh, you know doing data analysis and data science. So um, we we also we are trying to uh, incorporate that. And another thing is that uh, now the result will give back as a pandas data frame. You, you can do that with the new feature, but we want to do it the other way around. So what if you have cleaned your data in pan with, with pandas in Python, uh, you can, you know, you probably want to directly push it back to the, uh, to the database. So uh, we are trying to, um, you know, incorporate that and also more checks to, you know, prevent people making errors. So before the uh, queries fly to, uh, you know, fire to the backend, we want to maybe do some checking and also check if the version is correct. Um, so that's it for me. Uh, so if you're more interested to know about Terminus DB, we have a week, we have a weekly uh, webinar that is uh, 4 p.m. UK time every Thursday. Uh, I'm doing this, uh, you know, Waco Pi tutorial every uh, Friday, um, 4 p.m. UK time. So you can actually follow me on Twitch and get all this content. And um, about Terminus DB, well, if you're interested, you know, go to the website, follow us on Twitter. And the best thing is we have a Discord community. So uh, actually the community there is lovely, trust me. Um, just join through the link and we want to hear from you. So um, basically that's it for me. Uh, all this link is available in the slides. I put the link in the chat and I'll be hanging around any questions. Uh, you can just ask me. I'll also put the link of my um, tutorial afterward as well. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Chuck. Great talk. And now we're going to a break. Um, yeah, I don't know. Should I say anything? Just go go eat the leftover pizza and we'll be back. I have Wash your hands yet. before putting the hands on your <laughs> Exactly. Thanks, Chuk. Nice talk. I was wondering why ever, there's a lot of people on database companies. Yeah. It's, it's like mushrooms. That's what my friend said. It's everywhere. Um, <laughs> But uh, what we're trying to do is to fill in the gap that is missing uh, in the market because like we want to, uh, you know, well, first of all, we are very, very flexible graph database. We try to be more flexible than uh, Neo4j because of the way of uh, we handle the schema. And um, also, you know, we, th uh, the flexibility also provided this uh, Git-like features that you could time travel, you can branch and merge. So in the new version, actually, it's like uh, you can collaborate with people almost like a GitHub thing so yeah okay cool cool thanks um so just let's before make I a leave, break um yeah what, what what why did the man go into the pizza business <laughs>